Good evening. I'm Tricia Craig, Vice President of Engagement here at the college, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's discussion of what can the Quad do for Asia? For the past month, we have been witness to conflict and competition of global powers on the world stage, and the Indo-Pacific is another geopolitical theater where the world's most influential powers meet and the region that will likely de define what the post-American world looks, world looks like. Tonight's panel is part of a series presented by Yale and US on this new era of geopolitics. And we look forward to continuing to bring these critical perspectives into dialogue. We are very grateful to the Tan Chin Tuan Foundation for the support of this series. Before I turn the session over to tonight's moderator, I have just a few reminders for the audience. First, we ask that you do not take screenshots or record the session, but we will make the recording available on the college's YouTube channel. Second, we very much want your participation and welcome your questions. There's time set aside for audience questions. And if you're watching on Zoom, enter any questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you on Facebook, please use the comments section. The panelists will try to answer as many questions as they can. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our excellent moderator and my colleague, Rohan Mukherjee, Assistant Professor of Political Science here at the college. Professor Mukherjee is an international security specialist with a focus on the Asia Pacific region. His book, Ascending Order, Rising Powers and the Politics of Status in International Institutions will be published in August by Cambridge University Press. I will now leave the session in his capable hands. Rohan? Thank you very much, Professor Craig. It's really a pleasure to be able to host this and moderate this conversation. Uh, what I thought I'd do is I'd briefly introduce our, our speakers uh, before we you know, start a, a, an interactive discussion on the main theme for today. Um, <clears throat> our first speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Tanvi Madan, who is a senior fellow in the Project on International Order and Strategy in the Foreign Policy Program and director of the India Project at, Brookings, at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. Uh, her work explores India's role in the world and its foreign policy, uh, particularly India's relations with China and the US. Uh, Dr. Madan is the author of the book, Fateful Triangle, How China Shaped U.S.-India Relations During the Cold War, uh, which is out of Brookings, University, uh, Brookings Institution Press in 2020. Uh, next, we have Professor Rory Metcalf, who is the head of the National Security College at the Australian National University. Uh, his professional background involves three decades of experience across diplomacy, intelligence analysis, think tanks, academia, and journalism, including as founding director of the International Security Program at the Lowy Institute. Uh, he's been recognized as a thought leader internationally for his work on the Indo-Pacific concept uh, as, as articulated in his acclaimed 2020 book, Contest for the Indo-Pacific. And finally, we have Dr. Selina Ho, who is an assistant professor in international affairs at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, she specializes in Chinese politics and foreign policy with a focus on infrastructure and water disputes. Uh, she's the author of Thirsty Cities, Social Contracts and Public Goods Provision in China and India, which came out in 2019. She's the co-author of Rivers of Iron, Railroads and Chinese Power in Southeast Asia 2020, and co-editor of the Routledge Handbook of China-India Relations 2020. Um, so it's really hard to put together a stronger panel than this on, on this today's topic on the Quad and what it can do for Asia. Uh, so what I wanted to do really is start by um, uh, perhaps asking each of you in turn to, to just provide us with your, your sense of, uh, your answer to the broad question that we've posed for today, which is, uh, what can the Quad do for Asia? As you know, um, as you know, we've, you've all written and talked about this a lot, that you know, this is a, an organization that sort of has its roots perhaps earliest in the 2004 joint tsunami relief that took place in the Indian Ocean between the four navies of these countries, and then sort of you know, had a few meetings in between 2007, but then really revived into 2017, and now in a sense has come full circle in 2021 to providing regional common goods such as vaccines, infrastructure, climate resilience, and technology for the region. So uh, with that said, uh, perhaps Dr. Madan, I could turn it over to you and ask you to give your brief sense of what can the Quad do for Asia? Thank you. Uh, thank you to Professor Mukherjee, uh, also to Yale NUS. It's a, it's a real delight to be uh, on this panel, uh, particularly with Rory and Selena. Um, I think, you know, up front, I'll, I'll give you my bottom line and then kind of elaborate uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, and I think the bottom line is the Quad can be a regional so solutions provider um, for Asia. Uh, and that can range across a different, um, a, a whole range of issues. Uh, I, will, I will note that I said a regional solutions provider. It cannot be everything for everybody everywhere 
And sometimes there is a tendency to think about, you know, what the Quad is doing in, in every arena. And I don't think uh, that's what these coalitions, these flexible coalitions that we've been seeing uh, play out uh, a wide variety of them, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but in Europe. I don't think that's what they should be seen as uh, kind of, you know, one size fits all. Um, stepping back, I think when you saw these four countries, Australia, India, Japan, and the US, um, having not identical, but kind of shared and similar visions of the region they wanted to see in the Indo-Pacific. And you saw some overlap in kind of that, that vision, which was that they wanted to see a free, open, secure, prosperous, inclusive, rules-based order in the region where countries don't use force or coercion to shape facts on the ground uh, or other countries' choices, and where countries indeed did have high quality choices uh, to choose from. What you also saw these four countries a few years ago uh, and since seeing uh, together and having a shared perception that this vision of the region was also being challenged. Now, these challenges uh, were, uh, there were a wide variety of challenges. Um, some challenges like climate change, uh, like COVID, uh, but also, uh, even though it, it is usually said in euphem euphemisms, uh, they did see a challenge being posed by a more assertive China in the region that was trying to use force or coercion to shape facts on the ground uh, and other countries' choices. I think you also saw these four countries say they didn't think existing mechanisms in the region, uh, whether that was their bilateral partnerships and alliances or regional organizations like ASEAN or even international organizations was sufficient to deal with these challenges. They still thought these, each of these elements and mechanisms was necessary, but they did not think they were sufficient to dealing with these challenges. And so what was needed uh, was for like-minded countries to come together, like-minded and capable countries, to come together on issues where you did need that extra effort, where you did need to fill some gaps. And what you did need, and I think this comes to the question of being a regional solutions provider, is what was needed was the ability in the region to detect, deter, and defend against these various challenges. And for that, what you needed was two things. One, you needed to shape a favorable balance of power in the region. Uh, and each of the Quad members brings significant capabilities to the table, whether that's economic, military, technological. But you also needed to, and I think this is where we're going to see more, most of the work done with countries in the region. What you also needed was to build resilience in, their re in the region, not just the Quad members own, but particularly building the resilience of partner countries in the region uh, across a range of issues, whether that was in terms of health infrastructure, whether it was in terms of climate resilience, uh, whether that was in terms of security assistance and capacity building, uh, and across, uh, or in terms of uh, more transparency and high quality uh, technology. And I think the other thing you saw within this was these countries saying they wanted to provide choice. Uh, that is make a positive contribution in terms of providing answers to the regional questions uh, and problems that countries in the region uh, had. And I would stress that the Quad has been an evolving grouping. I wouldn't be, I don't know if we, we call it an organization yet. I know the countries themselves call it a flexible grouping, uh, but it has evolved in terms of framing, in terms of agenda um, over time. Um, and countries in the region have had a lot to do with it. I think there has been a recognition uh, that there has to be thinking about if, the, if it is going to say that it wants an inclusive region, you do have to take input from the region. You have to be responsive to mm. the region's concerns. And so the two ways I'd highlight, I think that you've seen a change in framing is that you have seen one, an effort, I think, to actually engage with the region on the quad, explain what it is, uh, for instance, to uh, countries in the region, try to solicit what does the region want? So you know, I'd flip the question, uh, what does Asia want from the Quad? And I think you've really seen the uh, leaders on now try to stress a positive approach, asserting that they're not against someone, but rather for something, that vision of the region uh, that I mentioned. Um, I think you've also seen kind of this emphasis on this regional solutions provider role. Within that, yes, also a regional security provider, role, 
Uh, but also framing even that in terms of what can the Quad do for the region? Maritime security could be combating IUU fishing. Uh, it could be disaster relief uh, operations as we've seen uh, quite recently. And it would mean these countries, not just doing everything everywhere together, but even just you know cooperation being uh, consultation, it's been coordination and it's been collaboration across a range of issues. I think that's also where you've seen uh, another change, which is the agenda has been influenced uh, by uh, kind of feedback from the region. So you've seen an agenda that now includes things like vaccine production and distribution, climate change and clean energy, critical and emerging technologies, supply chain resilience, regional infrastructure, uh, research and innovation, combating dis disinformation, uh, disaster res response, and I said maritime security, counterterrorism, cybersecurity, uh, and even space. And you know, we can talk more about some joint initiatives, including the global vaccine initiative that the countries uh, have. And I think that there is a recognition that there is a real importance in needing to deliver in that to show the region uh, that the Quad isn't this kind of abstract organization uh, that is, as China has tried to define it, an Asian NATO that is going to destabilize the region, but actually affect people's lives in the region in a, in a positive fashion. Uh, so I'll end with that, but I will just say um, uh, one thing about kind of the future. I think one of the big efforts of the Quad, and you heard this in the ministerial meeting that was held in Melbourne earlier this year, is a real effort to find ways and mechanisms of engaging with uh, partner countries in uh, Asia. And I don't just mean this in terms of, you know, the, the kind of either countries like Britain and France, who are European countries active in the Indo-Pacific or kind of uh, South Korea and East Asian countries, but countries in South, Southeast Asia, Indian Ocean Island states, real effort to see, you know, can the Quad find mechanisms and overlaps with ASEAN, for example? And I think there is that effort to say, we're not against ASEAN, we're not trying to replace ASEAN, we are trying to work with it. But I think the question for the region, not just what can the, um, uh, whether it's for individual countries, whether it's like grouping for groupings like ASEAN, what can the Quad do for, for you, but also are you willing to work with the Quad? Or will you get dissuaded uh, by the fact that it is, uh, it is the Quad? So I think as we see in the future, this is going to be one of the areas of emphasis. Terrific, thank you so much. Uh, Professor Metcalf, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rohan. And uh, I think Tanvi's uh, exposition covers a lot of the bases. It's important in answering this question, which is quite a, in some ways quite a pointed question, you know, what can the Quad do for Asia? Uh, to begin with the, the recognition that half of the Quad is effectively Asian. So in a sense, you know, what the Quad can do for India and Japan um, is the beginning of the answer to that question, in my opinion. But of course, the Quad, India, Japan, the United States and, uh, and Australia, of course, uh, part of the purpose of the Quad is to contribute to regional stability and to regional public goods. If we were having this conversation a few years ago, I think there'd be possibly more scepticism than there is today about what the Quad can offer. And I know even that some of the opinion polling that um, institutions in Singapore have produced over the years shows an increasing level of, of at least elite acceptance of the Quad and perhaps even support for it in um, some Southeast Asian countries. I would argue that um, the Quad is really uh, about several things. It's, it's, in a sense, it has two sides to it. It has the, the public goods side uh, that Tanvi has articulated, and that's accelerated, I think, more quickly than many of us expected, partly because the Biden administration was so attached to that mission for the Quad uh, and it hit the ground running with a strong agenda last year, as we all know. Uh, vaccines, critical technologies, uh, environment, you know, climate, essentially uh, uh, issues that no uh, self-respecting country can argue with uh, in terms of areas where, where we all need to help one another and the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think that the challenge there now is that the Quad has set a very ambitious agenda. Uh, it has very active working groups in the four countries. It's looking to engage, for example, with the, the private sector, the academic sector, society more broadly. But the clock is ticking on delivery. 
I would argue. And so I think the first thing the Quad has to do and can do for the region is, and really for the broad Indo-Pacific, um, Asia and, and beyond, is to demonstrate its ability to deliver against those agenda items, uh, you know, uh, delivering a, a quantum of, of vaccine support to the region. In a sense, that's the easy one. The harder aspect is to genuinely cohere the um, the private sectors in the four countries to uh, develop common approaches to critical technologies, to coordinate ideally the contributions of these four countries in areas like infrastructure and governance support in the region, and to do this in ways that are certainly non-threatening to the sovereignty and the independence and the self-respect uh, of and, and the choices of the many other countries in the region, um, Southeast Asia and elsewhere. So there's that side to the Quad. Uh, and in that, if you like, that inclusive side of the Quad, as I would see it, uh, there's also the prospect of the Quad being a core for larger coalitions of trust in the region. It doesn't all, of course, have to be just Quad. Ideas of Quad Plus on specific issues uh, in various individual countries have expressed some interest in this. So, for example, although it's not formally, it wasn't formally under a quad banner, uh, there was coordination with, I think, as I recall, um, New Zealand, uh, I think it was, I think it was the ROK and Vietnam um, some years ago or two years ago now in the early responses to COVID. And I could see all sorts of potential creative other quad plus arrangements with other individual countries. So serving as a kind of core group. Uh, for other initiatives and being ready to respond. I, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the tsunami, of course, which really was the birth of the Quad uh, back at the end of 2004. Uh, but now having that capability, that competence, that willingness to work together so that the four countries can very quickly form a core group to respond to other crises, but be very inclusive of other partners that want to work with them. Just turning briefly to the other side of the quad, and then I'd, I'd love to hand back to you, uh, Rohan, and also to hear from Selena. Uh, there is the more exclusive side of the quad, the idea that the quad is a strategic balancing arrangement. And I guess I would argue perhaps a little bit provocatively that that's, that's good for Asia too. Uh, you know, it's not as if uh, increasing the ability of these four countries to work together in a balancing or even potentially in a deterrence mode um, is a bad thing for the region if it can have a stabilising effect, uh, particularly on Chinese power. Now, I'm not pretending for a minute that the Quad is actually a, a secret military alliance or is likely to become a military alliance anytime soon, perhaps never. But, uh, you know, I think as we've seen the increased assertiveness and coercion uh, in the behaviour of uh, the People's Republic of China over the past few years. You know, I think a number of countries in the region have um, both publicly and privately expressed great misgivings about that. And it gives a little bit of confidence to other countries in the region when they see um, the Quad at least taking a stand on positions of principle, uh, but not moving towards military confrontation. So I think there's a whole lot of value the Quad can add, but I would just conclude by emphasizing that uh, I think no sensible policy leader in a Quad country pretends or imagines that the Quad is the solution to all of the region's problems or that it's the only game in town. Thank you so much uh, for your comments. Uh, Professor Ho, pass it on to you, thanks. Oh, I, I think I'm mute. <laughs> yes, I forgot. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here uh, uh, and uh, to speak at this event to be with Tangi and Rory as well, and Rohan and Trisha. Uh, well, um, so I think that Tangi and Rory has really laid out, uh, you know, uh, very clearly what are the various initiatives of the court and the roles that they can play in the region. I thought that maybe I should. Uh, you know, have a look at what China looked, how China looks at the Quad, uh, the strategies it has used, and then also uh, talk a little bit about ASEAN uh, expectations and reactions uh, in relation, you know, to the fact that they actually look at the Quad in terms of their of their ties with China. So it's not like they look at the Quad uh, on its own, but it's always with an eye to how China would feel about the Quad. 
So uh, let me just start with perceptions, Chinese perceptions of the court. And I think we already noted someone, uh, Rohan Yaitendu, you noted at the beginning, the Chinese was dismissive of it um, in the early days. Uh, and they see it as a sea foam, right? That will dissipate uh, rapidly. That's the kind of language that the foreign minister, uh, Chinese foreign minister Wang said. And then, uh, you know, that at that time, I think the Chinese didn't believe that the court will pose much of a challenge, uh, primarily because of the differences um, among the key players, particularly India, uh, being added to the equation. Uh, however, these perceptions soon shifted and it became more worrisome for the Chinese when it looks like the court is here to stay. And this is uh, something that happened probably in the 2020s, uh, late 2020, sorry. Uh, when the foreign ministers uh, of the court members actually agreed to meet once a year uh, in, in late 2020. Um, and then you have, you know, the leader summit and subsequent meetings that make the court meetings much more regular. And then there was the idea of the court class groupings involving, uh, as well, we mentioned Vietnam, South Korea, New Zealand taking shape. And then at that same time around that period, you see all these escalating tensions, uh, disputes between China and Australia, and uh, also with India, uh, the, um, the border clashes in June 2020. So all these, all these you know, uh, beliefs that original initial beliefs that uh, the court wouldn't pose much of a challenge actually came together uh, to make the Chinese realize that they have to take this much more seriously uh, than they actually did in the beginning. Uh, you know, so you can see the change in Chinese rhetoric of the court as a clique uh, a, a small clique, uh, a block confrontation, uh, reflecting core mentality, and uh, stirring trouble among regional countries. So these the change in rhetoric from the Chinese side. So as you know, the perception of the court as containing China, China's rise, Asian as an Asian NATO, uh, and and the stress on you know the exclusivity of the court, uh, and versus China's emphasis on inclusivity, right? Uh, then you have AUKUS uh, happening, and then the, of course the idea of the Indo-Pacific. So besides containment, China see, also sees uh, the court as ideologically driven uh, with its value-based kind of ideas, democracies, openness, freedom of navigation versus China's authoritarian model. So in other words, the court actually makes China and the idea of the Indo-Pacific makes China the other. So the other, uh, at the odd man out of Asia. And this is something that you know, uh, uh, China would prefer not to happen, obviously. So therefore, in the context of Asia, China sees the court as destabilizing and splitting the region. So you know, to answer the question, what can the court do for Asia? Well, it's pretty obvious that China would prefer the court doesn't exist. Uh, so I think that that's my bottom line here. Um, it expects the court to have a negative impact on Asia and would prefer the court not to exist, right? So what are Chinese strategies dealing with, with the court? So I think the original uh, strategy was a driving an, a wedge. I think a few commentators have, have mentioned that before uh, regarding you know, uh, India as the weak link, weakest link uh, because of its uh, differences in policies and ideas from the US. Uh, and then later on, I think when that didn't work with problems uh, with the border clashes and the problems uh, happening with India and then uh, obviously with Australia as well, uh, it turned to trying to improve its relations with its smaller neighbors and focus on other regional institutions which where China actually has more influence, uh, such as ASEAN. And then of, obviously, uh, a part of the motivation of the Chinese, uh, 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 Chinese um, wanting to be part of RCP and also applying for membership to the CPTT, CPTPP has to do with uh, the, the motivation of balancing court in the region. Uh, by emphasizing that China is inclusive, integrated into the region, unlike the United States, you know, which is not part of RCP or CPT, CTPP, CPTPP. And then uh, the idea of China providing economic goods, creating win-win situations. So this is the Chinese uh, part of it. Um, and then how do ASEAN countries, you know, look at what? We know that there is a mixed, uh, there is, it's a mix, it's ASEAN 10 countries, you can't really lump them into one particular view. There's a range of views within, within ASEAN. Uh, there is a certain ambivalence, uh, general ambivalence towards the court. The, wor the worry is that, you know, that it will increase confrontation between China and the court in the region, and which will be destabilizing for, for the region. 
So, but you know, there's no one consistent stand. You have a range of it. Uh, but if you were to say broadly speaking, they would prefer the court to pay less attention to security matters and increase their involvement in the region's economy and dealing with climate crisis, pandemic, cyberspace. And, and as noted earlier by uh, Rory and Tanvi, that this is something that the court has been paying attention to and responding very well, actually, in my opinion, to what ASEAN wants. But basically, ASEAN worries about two things. One is that um, China's reaction, if it were to be more supportive of the court, meaning that you know, we find that in the region, many times ASEAN countries make decisions with an eye to China's interests. So this is, this is a case where China, they are mindful of China's reaction if it becomes more supportive of the court. Uh, obviously, the other one, which was mentioned uh, indirectly somewhat just now, um, the fear that ASEAN centrality would be undermined. So, you know, so, so, so the, reach, the region would prefer that, you know, the court tone down its, uh, you know, this direct confrontation with China, moving away from that kind of rhetoric, which it did, which, is, which I think the region is happy with. Uh, and then, uh, you know, focusing on all the other things that the region wants, which is uh, what Tanvi and Rory was talking about just now. But I think one area where the region really wants is economic goods. And uh, Biden's, uh, President Biden's uh, Build Back Better initiative is a good one, providing a balance. But there's skepticism, I think, in the region that um, the court can do much in terms of like, compared to what China is able to do through its PRI. There is skepticism that the economic part of it can actually uh, be that impactful. Um, I think that there's also the, uh, you know, the mention uh, that Rory mentioned about um, the court providing some sort of balance. I think that's also kind of happening. Uh, it, you know, um, the court can help to balance uh, China in the South China Sea, but that is a very, very, uh, that's a very, very, uh, that's a very fine line that ASEAN, you know, even if it wants court to play this role, it's a very fine line to thread be between being a stabilizing force in the South China Sea and being a destabilizing one. Um, I think that's all I, I have to say. Uh, thanks very much, Roman, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. All right, great. Uh, so I just wanted to remind our audience on Zoom and on Facebook to uh, post, start posting their questions. We will turn to audience questions in about 10 minutes. Meanwhile, I just wanted to pose a few questions of my own to you uh, to get the conversation going. Um, and I guess uh, this is really for, for everyone, but um, whoever feels they can answer it first. Uh, Rory mentioned that you know, the quad is greater than the sum of its parts. And I wanted to sort of push on that a little bit, you know, which is, is it uh, greater than the sum of its parts or is it more of a sort of repackaging or recategorization of what individual countries have been doing or plan to do in the future? And it seems that Japanese infrastructure has been sort of you know, combined with say Australian aid and Indian political relationships and US security to sort of create this, you know, co combined entity as it were. And, and, you know, as Tanvi said, it's not an organization and yet has a very ambitious agenda. So how does the Quad intend to achieve this agenda without the organizational heft of say an ADB or an AIIB? You know, you really do need the service delivery capabilities uh, to do that. So I guess that's my first question. Uh, perhaps Rory, since uh, you mentioned the, it being greater than the sum, you could take that and we could pass it to Tanvi after that thank you thanks rohan and i'll i'll keep it brief um I, look I'm, I'm not sure even if I, I i might sort of correct what i said now i'm not even sure i'd necess i would necessarily say it's greater than the sum of its parts but it's it can be a formidable combination um because let's face it um most countries are not the sum of their parts their own parts most times when they engage in international affairs and most combinations of countries struggle to be as good as the sum of their parts. So even if the Quad can basically, can effectively aggregate the capabilities of the four countries and achieve some kind of meaningful division of labor. And in fact, also, as I think the Quad is doing, if the Quad can actually help the four countries influence one another to coordinate their engagement in the region more, region more clearly. I mean, for example, in the area of critical technologies, where uh, you know Australia, India, the United States, and Japan all come at cyber and critical from uh, different perspectives, we've got quite different uh, capabilities. Uh, private sector, industry, research. Uh, we have some differences 
uh, in our laws and in even the principles that we bring to bear on governance of critical technologies. But we are beginning to move closer together and we are beginning among the four countries through our working groups to talk about trusted supply chains. Now, if we can build that degree of trust and then offer that to the region as partly as an alternative, frankly, to uh, some of the China-centric uh, supply chains and processes, but also as simply another choice, then I think I actually think that's enough. So I'm, I'm, I am dodging your question a little bit. Um, there is the sensitive issue of whether the Quad needs a, a formal organisation, a structure, a secretariat. I'm going to throw that ball to Tanvi and maybe jump in again later on. Um, as, as Rory knows, I'm wary of just kind of a large secretariat because then it becomes it, there's danger of becoming something that I learned here. The Defense Department uses the term a self-licking ice cream cone. You exist for the purpose of the organization itself rather than the outcomes. And I think, you know, that should be the focus. And if that requires greater kind of uh, institutionalization, which I think we're seeing. So I think what we're seeing right now is a phase of greater institutionalization without necessarily formalization. But if that, if kind of the agenda that and the outcomes require, uh, and I think that's what should drive uh, the institutionalization, not, you know, um, starting from that. Uh, if that requires more kind of formalization, I'm, uh, Rory has helped me change my mind, that's fair enough. And if it, if it means that the Quad can, has greater sustainability across governments in, in the various countries. Um, to the question, Rohan, I think, you know, you've already seen examples of how the Quad engaging with each other in kind of the Quad, so to speak, uh, can be helpful to the region uh, in a way that individually or even bilaterally the countries might not have. Um, and, I'll, and I'll give you a couple of examples, but I also say, I mean, this goes back to the, the question of what the Quad is. In some senses, it's a consulting and coordinating mechanism as much as it is a, you know, everybody doing everything everywhere together. So, you know, in regional infrastructure, yes, Australia, US, Japan, for example, uh, have a couple of uh, joint projects. But I don't think the idea for the Quad has been that, you know, even in the regional infrastructure space, uh, in fact, you wouldn't want all four countries to be trying necessarily to do things together because uh, that would be too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, and so, you know, what could be helpful, for example, in the uh, connectivity space is on digital connectivity. You know, the four countries with the heft that they have and the capabilities offering an open RAN solution. Uh, in the 5G space to and giving choice to the region so that they're not st stuck with one or the other and can participate as well. So, you know, in the standard setting and those kind of things. Uh, but the couple of examples I'll give you is that one, you know, for example, think about the tsunami uh, that affected Tonga recently. You saw, I mean, we don't often see these things, but behind the scenes, you see these four countries acting like that core group um, that you saw them coordinating with each other and with other countries who were helping, uh, but then also bringing in a country like India to throw in assistance, which usually it wouldn't do because Tonga is further off than it usually, or at least it's not one of the Pacific Island states, it engages with as much as, say, a, a Fiji. Um, so you have seen kind of this being an addition to what you would have seen. I also think, for example, if you think back to the 2004 tsunami, this set of four countries could today be that rapid reaction group uh, in a much more effective diplomatic uh, and maritime security disaster response way than they could then because they have been doing not both the kind of, you know, the softer and the harder side of that, you know, security and solution provider role. So I think that is what, when you're thinking about uh, how can it be more, but I will just kind of end with saying um, part of what is uh, um, important about the Quad, that it's an enabler for these four countries to increase their own engagement with each other. And so as important to me, in fact, sometimes more important in the Quad, is that it has both enabled and been built on their increasing bilateral interactions, their increasing trilaterals. I think Rory used to say, you know, the Quad has made the world safe for the trilaterals, um, but also engagement that they have, you know, sometimes it's two of the quad countries, uh, 
and uh, a Southeast Asian country. So for example, one of the trilaterals is Australia, India, Indonesia. Um, or you have one-offs like the US, India, Japan, Philippines group sail through the South China Sea. Um, so I think you know, this is part of kind of that network or the spider web, which is moving away from that hub and spoke model of kind of alliances that you saw uh, built around the US. This is the region engaging with itself and the quad is an enabler of that and also reflective uh, of that trend. Uh, Rohan, may I just add a Please, little? of course, yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna say too much, but I actually agree uh, this enabling effect. So, um, you know, I see the quad as having a multiply effect on all these individual efforts that the countries have put in in the region. Um, it multiplies, right? When there's a grouping uh, uh, to, uh, you know, in, in terms of, for instance, in infrastructure, um, one of the things that we noted in our book, uh, Rivers of Iron, which is about uh, partly about the BRI, but focusing on uh, the idea of the Pan-Asia Railway and infrastructure building in the region. One of the things that we noted was that the US cannot do it alone. Um, and we know that the United States have been greatly weakened, uh, much, much weaker than it was ever was, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in than before. So it, it doesn't make sense for the US to do it alone here, um, especially when it comes to economic issues, uh, working with Japan, working with Australia, you know, all these will, will become, will have a multiplied effect on whatever the US is able to do. The US can't do it alone now. And I think this is uh, the right way uh, for the region um, uh, and something that the, re the region actually welcomes uh, when it comes to alternatives, uh, as someone mentioned, alternatives to China. So Sagina, while, while I have you, Ashley, I did have a question for you based on your own research in the region on the infrastructure yeah. projects. Um, some people sort of talk about the Quad's new focus on high standards infrastructure as being a sort of competitor of the BRI, right? And, and I wonder what your assessment is of that, the potential for that to compete with the BRI, but also is there room for those two strategies to be complementary or will they always be pitched and seen as substitutes? Okay, there are several, there are several elements to this question that I need to unpack. So there's, so there are few. Can can the two complement uh, the emphasis on high standards and therefore offer, offering another choice to the region? And the other one is, uh, can they can the BRI, BRI and the meaning the Chinese and the Quad countries with the emphasis uh, on uh, high standards infrastructure can they actually cooperate on a project? I think there there are two there are two elements here, right? So. Um, I think that there is um, there is definitely room for that for that uh, alternative that the region looks for, but the problem with that is that I think the amount of we have to be very clear that there's no way that uh, the Quad countries can match the Chinese in terms of the amount of money that they can invest overseas in infrastructure, and we know that getting the private sector in uh, you know in uh, these countries the Quad countries to be involved in this infrastructure project is going to be tough, primarily because of, you know, you can't do what the Chinese state do, mobilize, you know, its SOEs, even its private sector to, to do all these things. It just doesn't work that way in, uh, you know, uh, democratic capitalist countries. So that's one, one thing. The, the region is, I think, uh, very aware that while there's this alternative, it will never be able to match what the Chinese can do. Now, the, there is, has been talk of a possibility of cooperation between you know, BRI projects and what the court has been initiating, but I, I think that's more like talk rather than anything substantive. I, I find it difficult that something like this can happen, uh, to believe that something like this can happen. Uh, they are actually much more like competitors than being able to collaborate on projects. I haven't seen, uh, at least I have, I, at least I'm not aware of any projects that they have actually collaborated on. I mean, there'll be differing standards, you know, differing understanding of lending, of, of uh, all the rules that go with it. So I don't know how that will actually work out. So that's going to be, be tough, I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some questions from our audience, uh, which I'd like to pose to all of you. Uh, let's take two of them together. One, the first question is, uh, is there a risk of dilution of the quad's effectiveness by the excessive broadening of its agenda? Is there a balance that is to be sought here? That's the first one. And the second being, uh, will the quad be an equivalent of NATO in Asia as proposed by, by, uh, by some? Um, and, and would that worry China to make it, push China into more conflictive or conflictual posture? Um, NATO has already picked up a bad name. Uh, you know, it's been weaponized as a concept in 
in Europe. And uh, the question is, of course, can China do the same with smaller countries in this region? So uh, perhaps, um, you know, Rory, would you like to pick up on that and, and we'll take it from there? Either of those questions, whatever strikes your fancy. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to address both of those questions. Of course, there's a risk uh, that if you dilute the agenda too much, that the institution or the, if we can call it an institution, it's, it's going to be less effective. So I think the, for the next two years, I would argue that the Quad needs to focus very heavily on delivery uh, and implementation of the, the many uh, ambitions that have already been set in the, um, the leaders' meetings. And the leaders' meetings should serve now to really check in on the on progress rather than flag whole new directions. There's got to be some scope for the Quad to respond to circumstances. And I certainly think that uh, it should always be willing to mobilise for crises or disasters in the region. Incidentally, um, you know, I think it's quite plausible to see a disaster response in the region where, where, where the Quad countries do coordinate with China. Uh, in fact, I think that that would be quite you know, quite logical and desirable, but it's about, frankly, building a bit more confidence in one another to be able to do that without any sort of adverse security effects. And I think looking at the South Pacific at the moment, for example, is obviously pretty profound, profound mistrust there, uh, which will be amplified by the news just in the last uh, 12 hours or so of um, reported news of uh, Chinese interest in a military presence in Solomon Islands. Moving to the question of NATO or uh, an alliance-like structure. Um, look, again, I, I don't think there's either great risk, depending which side of the fence you sit on. I don't, don't think there's either great risk or great hope of uh, the Quad becoming like NATO anytime soon with a formal treaty, uh, you know, obligations to um, support one another in a security crisis. There is, of course, the, the Malabar exercise, and there is a naval exercise or a maritime military exercise of, of quite large scale now that, while not officially under the Quad umbrella, conveniently involves the same four countries now that Australia has been brought into that exercise. So, of course, there is growing security cooperation and dialogue among the four countries, but usually in bilateral and trilateral arrangements, just with, with Malabar over the top. That's still a long way from anything like NATO. And if I've argued that if the Quad or any of the other many laterals in the Indo-Pacific were to move in the direction of uh, formal treaty arrangements, um, you know, personally, I don't see that so much as being a, um, a driver of Chinese coercion, but, but a, res a response to it. And I think in many ways, the success the Quad has had already um, is, is due to the, the growing mistrust of um, the PRC's behaviour in recent years. So the ball is in China's court, in my view. Terrific. Uh, would anyone else, uh, uh, maybe Thambi, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, no, I largely agree. I would just say that, you know, uh, echoing Rory's point, and I think it's a broader question of whether on the infrastructure or in disaster response, you know, the, 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 Folks often ask the Quad countries, you know, would you engage with China? I would flip the question. Is Beijing willing to engage with the Quad? And is it willing to even, you know, um, stop telling ASEAN countries or South, Southeast, Southeast Asian countries individually or South Asian countries um, don't engage with the Quad? I mean, we saw the Chinese ambassador to Bangladesh openly saying, don't engage with the Quad. So, you know, when the uh, when kind of that's a perfectly good example of, you know, uh, impinging on a country's autonomy to choose their kinds of engagement and make choices. So I, you know, I, I do think, you know, this question of and some, some, you know, you can dismiss this as a security dilemma question. But if you look at the chronology and particularly India's participation in the Quad, its agreement to revive it, its agreement to uh, deepen the Quad, to elevate it to the lead. It is directly linked to India's perception of a greater challenge from China that it cannot meet alone. And so if you think about you know, the, the origins of the Quad, it's obviously kind of the, it goes back to the tsunami. But if you look at kind of the conceptualization and kind of driving it forward, 
the original quad father, so to speak, is Shinzo Abe, but the quad father of the revival is Xi Jinping. Um, and it was because China's behavior, not China's rise per se, China's assertiveness vis-a-vis -vis each of these countries, but towards other countries in the region as well, its actions in the South China Sea vis-a-vis -vis freedom of navigation, it made the Quad both desirable and feasible in a way that it had not been possible a few years ago. Um, I, and I'll just end with saying, I, like Rory, do not think this is going to be an Asian NATO. If an Asian NATO was possible in Asia, um, you wouldn't need a Quad. You wouldn't need AUKUS. You wouldn't need you know, the bilateral relationships because you'd have uh, NATO. There have been attempts to do this before. You know, um, uh, The US had CETA, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. It didn't really go anywhere. Um, the Russians, the Soviets, proposed an Asian collective security system. That didn't go anywhere. So I think you know, this is because um, there is a gap between kind of bilateral partnerships, regional organizations, et cetera. Uh, and you will see these coalitions or plurilaterals, minilaterals, whatever you want to call them, fill this space. Um, and they will be at different levels. Uh, you know, India is not willing to do and can't do um, what AUKUS does. That is more security focused. Uh, you know, someday maybe Japan will join that and become JOKUS or whatever the kind of term would be. Uh, but these are also plug and play. So you, you join at your comfort level, which I think is also an opportunity for countries in the region which is you pick your coalition that you want to engage with uh, and that you are comfortable engaging with. That could involve um, benefiting from them on things like security assistance and capacity building. So I would say, you know, ASEAN, other the region should stop worrying and learn to love the Quad because to Selena's point about infrastructure, it's actually giving you choice. So use the Quad, uh, do what the non-aligned did in the Cold War, play one off against the other avoid getting kind of crushed between the two blocks, so to speak, if you think they are blocks, uh, but use it and, and pick your preference in terms of uh, the range of engagement you want to have or engage with all, all the, the countries uh, involved. And that's a terrific point, actually, about what, what other states can do and how they can use both sides. Uh, Selena, would you like to add anything to this? Well, I just want to say very briefly that uh, I agree Asian NATO is not a possibility um, you know, if it had worked, it would have worked a long time ago. Um, the ASEAN countries would not want to see that happen. And I think that will be quite pivotal in whether this is something that's possible in this part of the world. Um, a formal security alliance is something that's just not within the culture of this region. Uh, I think that's an important uh, point to remember that it will go against the, the grain of um, non-alignment, all the you know, fears of, uh, of, of gutting, safeguarding of sovereignty and all that, it, it will just not go in this part of the world. Um, and definitely to, to, to um, uh, Tang Vi's point, you know, China would never, would, I, I think that's a valid point, you know, that, that looking at the, the, the court, I mean, it's not just about whether the court wants to work with China, but whether China works with the court. I think, I think what China will want to do is to ignore the Quad and you know hope that it goes away or you know it it doesn't work out and uh, the pressure is on ASEAN countries not to support the Quad. I think that's that's clear. So I don't think that um, you know China will want to work with it, which will make it legitimate uh, in the region, and that's something they will want to avoid. Uh, looking at it, I mean, with this rhetoric that these countries are are you know external to the external parties to the region. Um, and so I don't think that's going to work out. Uh, the playing off of the you know, uh, big powers, I think that's what countries, the 10 countries in ASEAN try to do, but with varying degrees of success and skill. I think that's something that we have to remember. Not all uh, ASEAN countries have the same level of skill, nor national interest uh, in terms of playing off one against another. You can see an alignment of interests on a spectrum. You can also see a variety of skills in trying to do that kind of uh, balancing or hedging uh, kind of behavior. So we have to remember that, you know, uh, those uh, capacities, uh, interests are all part of it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have three questions about um, India's role in the Quad and, and the sort of which raise questions about internal unity in the Quad. So the first is, is India relevant economically to the Quad? And then there are two questions about the differences in stances on Russia's invasion of Ukraine between the Quad countries with India on one side and the other three countries uh, on the other. 
Uh, so what does this portend in terms of internal unity within the Quad? Um, and, and does it impact India's own standing within the Quad? Is, these are audience questions. Uh, so Tanvi, as the resident India expert, please, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks, Rohan. Um, I think, you know, there's, uh, so there's a lot there. Let me get at the kind of Ukraine question since I know it's on, on people's mind. I think, you know, one of the things about if you are saying you are a, um, demo, a, a kind of a, a coalition of democracies, uh, you should be comfortable with difference uh, amongst that you can't, you're not there because you agree on everything. Even NATO countries have differences, including on Russia till kind of recently in terms of not necessarily objectives. I think, you know, the Quad shares an objective. India is not happy about the Russian invasion. It has uh, almost every one of its key interests has been adversely affected uh, by it. So I think the objective, which is, and kind of the interest in not seeing violations of territorial integrity and sovereignty are, um, are kind of a shared concern. Uh, I think the approaches are different. And, you know, the, the kind of the many parts to socialism uh, argument um, should hold in the sense that the differences in Russia are not new. We know that, um, that this was going to be a concern. In fact, Japan and India used to have a, a similar view of approach, which is you do need, you should reach out to Russia to keep it from deepening ties with China. So I don't think that part is new. I do think, you know, you have seen uh, the uh, kind of differences on responding, the kind of nature of response and the extents of response uh, to the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, put some kind of raise some questions. Um, but I will say, I think the effect is going to be complex. Um, you know, I think you will see on the one hand, the existence of the Quad itself is evidence of India's willingness to make choices that don't fit with Russia's preferences or demands. Uh, not just that, you know, you the defense capabilities from Russia uh, are the ones that enable Delhi to play the role uh, that Australia, Japan, and the US wanted to vis-a-vis -vis China, including in the maritime space, uh, but also holding the line at the border. Um, and you also saw, I think, the Quad serve as a platform for the leaders to discuss their differences, as well as the implications of the Russia-Ukraine war for the Indo-Pacific. And I think you've seen you know, the European crisis having driven home that contingencies in the Indo-Pacific that seem distant or unlikely, distant or unlikely uh, may require greater urgency or attention than the Quad countries might have thought. So potentially this actually increases rather than decreases the utility and necessity of the Quad. But you know, realistically, I do think you, you know, the Indian India's response has raised questions in other Quad countries about how India would react, if at all, to a Indo-Pacific contingency like in Taiwan. And this could lead to the perception that the Quad in India, you know, will have limited utility and potentially it's better to invest in other platforms that are seen as more effective in responding to the Indo-Pacific. I think much will depend on how these differences are managed between the countries. Um, and, you know, will this impact the level of enthusiasm in Australia, Japan, and the US for India? Uh, and, you know, how also how they weight, um, the relative weight and linkages between the European and Indo-Pacific theaters. Uh, and I think, you know, you're going to see China try to take advantage. You are seeing it. You will see this on uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi's vi visit uh, to India, perhaps, uh, to fuel frictions and a wedge between India and its Quad partners. Um, but I think, you know, there are also important questions for India in this regard. And I'll, I'll, that, that'll be kind of the final point I make, which is, you know, so far, India has had this view that it can, I mean, it doesn't put it so bluntly, but these are my words, that India can align uh, with the Quad countries and with other like-minded partners to balance or counter China, but it doesn't want to align with countries to uh, isolate Russia. Now, that worked um, for a fair bit of time. Maybe someday in the future it'll work again. But as Russia and China are deepening in a, a, their alignment, and this will be a result of the, likely be a result of this crisis, um, which is if they're align deepening their alignment with each other, uh, and perhaps even with Pakistan, um, how is India going to reconcile those two kind of, we will align with China, uh, uh, you know, to balance China, but not to isolate Russia. If they're aligning, what is this going to mean? So I think, you know, the, the, it's still too soon to tell what the impact will be of what's happening. 
But I think so much will have to do with um, how these countries manage their differences. Uh, and I, I think uh, if you are going to have, you know, this should not be a top down one country defining uh, what the, you know, the, what the quad um, should be doing. Uh, but I, you know, for example, I understand kind of India's point of view that you can't, you should, you know, it should be focused on the Indo-Pacific. But there's so much potential spillover from what's happening in Europe uh, that I think it's also going to be hard to say, just keep Europe and Indo-Pacific theaters separate. Um, so I think there's a lot to unpack here and um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I think a year from now, perhaps we can get together and see uh, what the impact has been, including on India's role in the utility, perception of utility of the Quad. Terrific, would either of the uh, uh, other two panelists like to chip in on this. Can I just touch on the economic dimension? Um, it was an interesting question to say, how is India relevant economically to the Quad? Uh, you know, the Quad provi the, the Quad involves quite a lot of complementarity among the four nations. They're complementary in so many ways. Obviously, they're, they're, you know, the geography is so dispersed. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why, of course, um, China finds the Quad challenging. There's a complementarity there. If you look at the four economies, you know, if you put it in very crude, stark terms, uh, Australia has resources, Japan has technology, the United States and Japan both have technology and capital, and India has, among other things, uh, extraordinary human capital, uh, and all that growth uh, and growth potential that's coming, and, 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 and the prospect of, um, of lower cost manufacturing, for example. So in the long run, I think there's extraordinary complementarity among quad countries for things like trusted supply chains. Uh, but again, I don't think, this, in, none of this is about any kind of um, you know, compartmentalized economic system. Uh, you know, India is no more or less relevant to the uh, the economics of the Quad than it is to the the economics of the world, which is which is quite a lot. So I'd probably leave it there. Sorry, uh, put myself on mute there. Uh, we we have an interesting question actually uh, uh, in the in the Q and A section, which is on. Um, ASEAN. So, Selena, if you don't, if, if you have some thoughts on this, so uh, you know, there's one scenario in which ASEAN worries about ASEAN centrality, uh, but in the long term, is there any threat to uh, ASEAN unity? Uh, it's your is loyalties being divided between the Quad and China. So, can ASEAN actually hold up uh, as an institution in the long term? Uh, ASEAN, ASEAN unity. Um... You know, I think the court is just many of the issues that will divide ASEAN, uh, but it has trudged along, right? I mean, it's trudged along for the longest time, despite all the differences uh, that are that are you know among the ASEAN countries. You have Vietnam, who might just be part of the court class. Uh, you have uh, Cambodia and Laos being much closer to China uh, than say you know uh, Vietnam or, or or Singapore, the Philippines or Thailand. Um, so I, I, it's a really difficult question to answer. I don't think that there will be, a, you know, a damage to. I won't see ASEAN breaking apart, but it has been trudging along for a long time. I mean, Myanmar is such a huge issue that divides ASEAN too, and all these, all these events actually essentially shows up the weaknesses of ASEAN. But still, you know, the thing about ASEAN is ASEAN is what is ASEAN about? ASEAN has never been about being a NATO or EU. Right. It, is, it has always been a platform for countries to talk, countries with varying in interests, uh, varying uh, perceptions, different political systems, different levels of economic system, uh, different levels of economic development. So, you know, we, we shouldn't expect ASEAN to, to have that kind of unity that you see perhaps in the EU. But you will trudge along, there'll be all these issues that come up, uh, but it has never broken apart formally, it's never exploded, imploded, you know, or, or in any sense. So it will impact ASEAN unity, but, you know, it will still carry on, but not in a way that will, it, that it will implode anything like that. Um, just seeing that. Yeah. Trudging along is a good motive for being, you know, in our third year of the pandemic. So um, <laughs> uh, if I could, if I could ch change focus a little bit to, uh, we have an excellent question also on, uh, on US politics and what it means if, uh, 
you know, at this point, uh, the president, President Biden and, and, and Tony Blinken have sort of put a lot of effort into reanimating U.S. ties in, in, in the region, in the Indo-Pacific, and investing in the Quad. Uh, and what happens if a, an America first candidate re-enters the White House in 2024? Uh, both from a regional perspective, what does that look like, but also from Washington's side, how might policies change? I really, this is, I think all of you are competent to speak on this, so fastest finger first. <laughs> Who would like to go uh, first? Or should I, I mean, just- I mean, since I'm yeah. in Washington, I can, I yeah. can just- Thank you. Say that, um, I mean, it, what's interesting is the Quad was revived during an America First um, candidacy. Uh, so I think, you know, and, and uh, I'll be honest, you know, 15, 16 months ago, um, in fact, the concern was that the Biden administration would not continue with the Quad. Um, and I think what you found, and I think this is relevant to the question about sustainability, um, is that when the Biden administration came in, I think there was some skepticism, uh, including about the concept of the Indo-Pacific itself. Um, but what you found is, uh, you know, and there could be various reasons for this, but you saw the kind of transition team, especially once they went into office, clearly get a sense of the extent of the challenge, challenges in the, in the region, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, but I think more broadly, also a sense that the US can't do this alone, uh, didn't want to do it alone. And in fact, the very America first, poli the, the politics that led to America first, which is why is the US doing this all the, on their own? What about burden sharing? Is, is kind of what um, led it to look for partners, like-minded partners that are also capable and are willing to you know, burden share, so to speak. And so I think you saw them then looking for these kind of partners or mechanisms that were willing and you saw within a month of taking office, uh, Secretary Blinken hosts two meetings. Uh, one was of the Quad foreign ministers and the other was of the US plus E3, the transatlantic Quad, so to speak. Um, and what you saw is after that, the Quad moved with leaps and bounds in ways that we hadn't seen. And so what that told me is that they came in and said, they, there was no kind of, uh, uh, there was no buy-in to the Quad necessarily, or there was no lock-in effect but because uh, it was too it was too, too early stage but they actually saw it as useful and saw these countries as willing to help them do that not going it alone not wanting to go it alone uh, um, uh, approach i think on the flip side you see for the countries in the region and i think you saw japan that had first proposed reviving this uh, i know this is the case in india but one of the reasons to actually agree to reviving the quad was to actually keep the U.S. tied into uh, Asia as much as possible. Um, so, you know, there, there used to be the concept in Europe of empire by invitation. Gerlund Dundestad had this idea that actually it wasn't the U.S. that imposed NATO, that it was these countries saying, you know, this is the way to keep the U.S. engaged and involved. And I think you saw this. Uh, and to me, me, the way I think about this is, you know, for India, the Quad is a mechanism to keep the U.S. engaged uh, in, in Asia, to, to, keep, to keep encouraging Japan to play a normal security role uh, and to keep uh, uh, China, uh, to keep Australia uh, on the kind of understanding the China concern piece uh, or staying on the same page with China. So I do think, you know, the politics, it will depend. Um, I think, you know, and, and this is the, on, uh, the concern part is whenever I'm asked to list what are the potential headwinds for the Quad, it is kind of one of the factors I often point out is political and bureaucratic buy-in. Because I think it has been, even if not the existence and sustenance, you know, the sustainment of the quad over time, sustainability of the quad, the, it requires and it's moved at this pace because of high level leadership enthusiasm. That's driven the momentum. And if you don't have that, and that has been very leader driven, uh, even though we've seen it now in multiple, at least two administrations in the US. And, and mind you, the Quad was started by a Congress party coalition in India as well, um, originally, that you did see, you, you know, you do see waxing and waning. And so, you know, the only real change in government we've seen for the Quad 2.0 has been in the US. Japan, yes, the change in prime ministers, but same party. I think the next one we'll see in Australia. So I don't know if Rory wants to say something about, about that, but I do think this is a genuine concern. And I think if the Quad is seen as effective uh, and useful, it will continue even in America first because it actually is a burden sharing instrument. Uh, but I, I think you know, 
uh, there is uncertainty about the U.S. role in the world, and uh, rightfully so. Uh, Rohan, can I just ask uh, comment on this and also Absolutely. comment on Lee, his, her view, which is that you know um, it it does make sense for America first to give support uh, to the to the court, but my question is related to domestic politics. You know, so if we have Trump coming back into the office, um, which is possible, and if he were to you know, he will come back with a very vengeful spirit. So the, the issue is not about, you know, uh, the US uh, not wanting to support the court, but what is the possibility of a very fractured uh, domestic uh, politics emerging in the US such that the attention is not on foreign policy or even China, but very inward looking as a result of all the troubles that, uh, you know, the US, uh, uh, pa the political parties, are, 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 are the way they're dealing with each other has become really fractured that attention's all inside the country and not external. So it's not a, a deliberate policy, but one that uh, as a consequence and you know, unintended consequence of that kind of fractured politics where US attention turned inwards instead of outwards, like what's happening right now. Isn't that a possibility, Hamdi? I mean, I can just very quickly say, and I know Rory will have things to say about this, is yes, it is. I think that's already the case. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the question, but it's not just a US question, right? It's a question for all the Quad countries, which is when you think about, are you able, willing and able to play a certain kind of role that the others envision for you? That ability part is affected by your ability to be an effective actor. Uh, in the kind of in geopolitical international space. And anything that affects that, your economic, military capabilities, your cohesion, absolutely will affect it. But I think that is more the reason, even if the Quad doesn't exist a decade from now, five years from now, if it partly enables the interactions and growing closeness between Australia, Japan, and India, uh, you know, the US for all these countries is a necessary element of balance in Asia. Nobody can replace that. So I think part of the hope is that the US won't do it for the region. It will do it for US, America's own national interest, uh, economic interest if nothing else. But also I think there's, you know, if the Quad does nothing else, but as I said, enables the ability of these three countries to engage with each other uh, much more, that is still making it worthwhile to partly hedge against uncertainty from the US. Uh, but I think this question is, is very apt, which is it's true in India as well. If you are so deeply insular and focused at home and unable to do the kind of things, go back to kind of a 1980s India, where you're so busy kind of uh, uh, focused at, at home that the, there's a limit to what you can do abroad. That's absolutely a, a valid question. And I think one of the risks uh, again, one of those kind of uh, headwinds that the Quad uh, could face. I think that's entirely reasonable concern. Terrific. Uh, Rory, over to you. Yeah, just two, two, quest two, two thoughts, I should say. Um, firstly, on the United States, on the possibility of a, uh, a Trump America first uh, revival, I, I would observe, though, that, uh, you know, Trump uh, and, and his administration uh, intensified strategic competition with China. And in fact, that it's one of, it, it's one of the few themes that sees, seems to unite uh, the American political spectrum. So, you know, I think the, the fundamental shift will be one where the United States not only turned inwards and not only had that uh, terribly fractured domestic politics, but basically decided it's not going to globally compete with China. I find that uh, a very far-fetched scenario. And I think to imagine that the United States is going to compete with China, then it follows the United States will need to continue playing a role in this region. And the big question then becomes defining what that role is and what's the role of the Quad in that strategy. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that the Quad is going to, will continue to have a, a role in a life. The other point I'd make is about changes of government more generally uh, among the four democracies. And, and Tanvi's right, Australia is the next cab off the, um, the rank. We have uh, an election probably in the second half, almost, well, certainly in the second half of May. The date hasn't been called yet, but it will be called very soon. 
I'm confident that if we have a change of government to uh, a Labor government, uh, the Quad will remain important. These bilateral relationships will remain important. And of course, that was not always going to be the case. Uh, famously, uh, a Labor government in Australia in 2008 uh, walked away from the Quad, even though uh, it's Kevin Rudd, the then Prime Minister, um, debates, um, debates that and debates whose decision it actually was. So I'm reasonably confident you will see bipartisanship among the four Quad countries endure. It will outlive any particular leader or any particular champion. Thank you very much. Um, all right, I think we are basically at time. So uh, this was a terrific conversation. I, I almost got, lost track of time and had to be reminded uh, that we're done. Um, I will hand back over to uh, Professor Tricia Craig to uh, close out our discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Rohan. And thank you so much to our amazing panelists. This was uh, a tremendously interesting and rich discussion. I think I speak for all of the audience to say how um, you know fantastic it was to listen to for um, terrific scholars. Um, and I also want to thank uh, our audience. I want to thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this lively and topical conversation. Um, if you're not already on our mailing list, please do sign up for it so that you don't miss any programs like this. Um, I think we can agree that, um, you know, these are worth tuning in for. Um, and we would also love to hear your um, ideas or your uh, thoughts about your experience tonight. So you can click on the link in the chat box to submit your feedback about tonight's session. And with that, I wish you, depending on where you are, a good night or a good start to your day. Thanks so much. Thank you, it was a pleasure. <laughs>